Welcome to Stories from Palestine podcast, a podcast recorded in Palestine and about Palestine. My name is Crystal. I studied history and tour guiding, and I live in Palestine with my Palestinian husband and children. I started this podcast during the COVID pandemic in the summer of 2020. And now that tourism is slowly coming back to Palestine, I will continue the podcast bi-weekly. So subscribe on your podcast player and turn on the notifications if you want to be reminded of new episodes. You can also follow Stories from Palestine on Facebook and Instagram, where I will share a virtual soundbite of each new episode. You can use this podcast episode as an audio tour when you visit the church. But if you are not visiting the church and you are listening, then just close your eyes if you can and just try to imagine what I'm telling you. You can also go online and find some photos of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. There are also a lot of videos on YouTube so that you can get an idea of what I'm talking about. But I'll try to be as descriptive as possible. Before we enter into the church in this audio tour, imagine that you are on a square in front of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. This square is on the southern side of the church and it is also called the parvis. And the term parvis comes from the Latin paradisus, which means paradise. And it used to indicate any open space in front of a church. To reach this square, you have to come either through the Muristan area, or as it is also called now, Suk Aftimos, or you pass from the Christian Quarter Street through a narrow road and a flight of stairs that pass the entrance of the Omar Mosque. A third way to arrive is from the roof of the church at Deir el Sultan. Then you come from the area, the convent area on the top of the church where the Ethiopians are located and you go through their convent and the chapels of the Ethiopians and the Copts and then you reach the square, the Parvis. Whatever way you choose, it is quite tricky to find the entrance of the Holy Sepulchre Church. But when you found it and you are in front of the entrance, then you can see a small part of the Crusader Bell Tower, the only part that remains of the Bell Tower, because most of the upper part of the Bell Tower was lost during earthquakes. And now if you look up above the entrance of the church, you will see two windows. And below it is the ledge with the immovable ladder. And we talked about the immovable ladder in the last episode. This is the main entrance to the church. And actually, it's also the only entrance to this very important and famous church. And it is not the kind of impressive entrance that you would imagine. Originally, there were two crusader entrance gates. Both were made of wood. The right one has been bricked up and is now closed, although you can still see the arch in the columns. It is not known exactly when this happened, but we know that the only entrance to the church is now the left door, and it has a beautifully carved wooden door and as we discussed in the last episode the door is opened and closed by two Jerusalem Muslim families the al Jaud al Husseini family and the Nusayba family if you look to the left of the door you can see a marble column with a big crack it is a fissure of about 1 meter 20 in length and it looks like a flame that is rising upwards. Now, some say that this crack was caused by an earthquake, but others point to the year 1579, in which the Greek Orthodox were not allowed to enter the church to celebrate their yearly feast, the Feast of the Holy Fire. So the Ottomans did not allow them to get into the church and the Feast of the Holy Fire is a very old tradition. It's the tradition in which the patriarch on Holy Saturday, the Saturday before the Easter, 
enters into the edicule, the place of the tomb of Jesus, and then he prays, and then he receives the holy fire by a miracle from God, and he can light candles from this fire, and this light is then spread to other candles among the people in the church, and from there even taken to other cities in the Holy Land, and even with airplanes abroad to other churches in other countries. Now, on that Holy Saturday in 1579, they were not allowed to get into the church and they stayed outside to pray, outside on the parvis. And then, miraculously, the column split and the holy fire appeared from the column and the patriarch could light the candle from there and the fire was spread quickly via all the candles over all the Christians who were present. And the Ottomans, they were so surprised, so astonished, that they then allowed them to go inside the church. So that's the story of the column. Now we are still only at the entrance of the church, and I have to mention another three things before we enter. First of all, above the church entrance, there were two lintels of marble. They had beautifully engraved reliefs. These were taken down in the 1930s by the British. And some sources mention that they were removed because of a fire. Others say it was removed because of an earthquake. But the lintels were damaged and they were removed. But you can still see them. Because today, if you visit the Rockefeller Museum in Jerusalem, you can see the lintels of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre's entrance. And the Rockefeller Museum is interestingly the first Palestinian Archaeological Museum. It was named the PAM, Palestinian Archaeological Museum, and later it was renamed the Rockefeller Museum after an American business magnate and philanthropist who financed the museum. That was during the British Mandate time. Now, if you look at the right side of the entrance, then you can see some stairs that are leading up to a chapel. It's a chapel with a small dome on a higher level. And this was the entrance that the crusaders used to get up to the Calvary or the Golgotha. That is where they commemorated where Jesus was crucified. But before getting there, they would commemorate at station number 10 of the Via Dolorosa that Jesus was stripped of his clothes. Today, people first enter into the church and then they go up the stairs to commemorate on the Golgotha. And below this area, there is a small chapel that is dedicated to St. Mary of Egypt, who is said to have been a prostitute who changed her life and became a newborn Christian and lived there for a number of years in seclusion in a small chapel on the parvis, on the square in front of the church. And now we are really stepping inside the church and we are in the southern part of the church. And right in front of us, we see a large flat stone with many lamps hanging above it and a big mosaic behind it. And on the mosaic, we see the scene of the New Testament that tells about how Jesus was taken from the cross after he died and he was anointed with palms and then wrapped in linen cloth and then they brought him to the grave. This is the location where, according to tradition, this actual scene took place and it is commemorated right on that spot. But the stone that we see here is not 2,000 years old. It is not the stone on which Jesus was bombed, because this is a new stone dating from around the year 1810. So that is during the Ottoman Empire. It is also called the Stone of Unction, which means the act of anointing someone with oil or another anointment, the Stone of Unction. And usually you can see a lot of pilgrims around this stone. Many of them will kneel down and then they spread some water on the stone and they rub their souvenirs over the stone as if they 
want to bring some of the sacredness of the place, the holiness of the stone with them home in their souvenirs. And many believe that this has certain healing powers, that it brings blessings. But even though this is the first thing that you see and witness when you come into the church, the traditional route doesn't take us straight to the stone of unction. Most pilgrims, when they enter into the church, they will first go up the stairs directly on the right. And this is very hard maybe to imagine if you are not there, but the stairs are leading up to the cliff on which Jesus was crucified, according to the tradition. Remember from the last episode, we talked about the stone quarry, how Jesus was crucified on a cliff overlooking the stone quarry. So basically, as we're entering the church, we are down in the stone quarry. That is the lower part because the stones were cut out there and removed to be used as construction material. But going up the stairs, we are going up on the cliff. And it's very hard to imagine even when you are there, because obviously it doesn't look like a cliff anymore. It is now a church building and it's full of icons and wall paintings and mosaics. So you really have to use your imagination. I have gathered some drawings and images that I found online that I will put on the website and share on social media so that you can get a better idea and you can always Google it yourself. If you use search terms like Holy Sepulchre and Quarry, Stone Quarry, you will probably find some of the same drawings that I found. When you go up the stairs, you will find yourself in a chapel. So it doesn't look like the cliff anymore, not at all, because this part of the church is built over the cliff and the floor has been paved. So nothing remains of that rocky cliff that is now below the surface, except for one place where you can see a little bit of that natural rock. It is now covered with protective glass and it is right next to the altar. And that is also the place where below the altar you will find a circle-shaped sign that indicates where the cross of Jesus was set up for his crucifixion. So as I explained in the previous episode, there are nine religious sites that are shared between the different religious denominations. And the status quo agreement, remember, indicates who is responsible for which part of the church. So the Church of the Holy Sepulchre has chapels for the Roman Catholics, for the Greek Orthodox, for the Armenians, for the Syriac, and for the Copts. And the Calvary, or the Golgotha, where we are now in our audio tour, is divided between the Catholics and the Orthodox. If you are in the chapel, the right side is for the Catholics and the left for the Orthodox. And you can see the difference because the Orthodox side is much more decorated than the Catholic side. And in this area, we have the 11th and the 12th station of the cross. So the first nine stations of the cross are outside of the church, remember? And then we have station number 10. I mentioned it. It's right beside the Golgotha, where Jesus was stripped of his clothes. And that used to be the area that gave entrance to the crusaders. So they would be coming from the stairs outside and then into the church. And now comes something very interesting. So we can see some of the bedrock next to the altar. So that's the original rock, the white stone of the cliff that was overlooking the quarry. And it is now protected by glass. But if you look, you can see that inside the rock, there is a big crack. And some people believe that this crack was the result of an earthquake that happened, according to the Bible, when Jesus died. Now, it is also believed by some people that directly below the Golgotha, in a cave, the first man on earth, Adam, was buried. And he was also the first sinner the first one who didn't obey God's word. And it is said that when Jesus was on the cross, that his blood dripped down through the crack in the rocks, down onto the remains of Adam. And this is what redeemed him. 
maybe for people who are not Christian, it is important to explain that Christians believe that Jesus was the Son of God and that God sent him to the world with a message of how to live together. And he had to die, like they used to sacrifice animals to God before when they had sinned and they wanted to make things right with God. But now this time, the death of the Son of God was the way to redeem all of the people. So through the sacrifice of this one person, of Jesus, the Son of God, the sins of all humans could be then forgiven by God. So now if you go down another flight of stairs, it's opposite the one that you came up on, and you go down and take right, then you have the chapel of Adam. And there you will see the rest of that bedrock with the crack, the same crack that you saw up on the Golgotha, the continuation of that. And so some people believe that that's where the blood of Jesus dripped on the remains of Adam. And this symbolizes the redemption of all the people. If you are in the church during this audio tour and you saw the chapel of Adam, you go back and then we take left. So from the steps down, we take left towards the stone of unction because the stone of unction is the 13th station of the cross. This is where Jesus was anointed. And then we will continue past the stone of unction because we already mentioned it. And we will continue towards the place where Jesus was buried. But on our way, we will pass by a small circular stone with four pillars and a marble canopy. This is on our left. And this is a small shrine that is called the Station of the Holy Women. And this place commemorates that Jesus' mother and two other women, who were also called Mary, watched the crucifixion of Jesus from that point. Now, this part of the church is under the Armenians. And on the wall behind the shrine, you can see a large mosaic which recalls the scene of the women who are looking at Jesus hanging on the cross. And now you reach the most important part of the church. Now you will enter into the rotunda. It's a circle-shaped structure with a dome high up through which light is coming from the top of the dome into the church. And in the middle of this rotunda is the edicule. And literally, edicule means little house. And inside the edicule, Christians believe, is the grave in which Jesus was buried. So it's written that there was a man, a Jew, who was called Joseph of Arimathea, who had a new grave that was never used before, and that he allowed Jesus to be buried there. So just try to picture it. We are now inside the stone quarry of 2000 years ago. We just came down from the cliff where Jesus was crucified. Then they brought him down into the quarry. And there, on the western side of the quarry, there were some caves prepared to function as graves. And that was very common in ancient times to use existing caves to dig out extra space into the limestone rocks and then bury people inside these tombs. Of course, if you know the Bible story, Jesus was resurrected after three days. So the tomb was empty after that. And now imagine about 300 years later, Emperor Constantine and his mother Helena came to the Holy Land. They came to search for the locations where the stories from the Bible happened. And when they arrived here, they removed the temple that Hadrian had built and they found under the rubble that they had removed this burial cave inside the rocks. And they wanted to cover it, to protect it with a church, a place where people could gather and venerate this location. So they brought in workers who cleaned the place and then they cut out the rocks around the grave. So they completely removed all the rock, all the stone around the cave just to leave the area of the burial site. 
And over this tomb, over this place, they built a small chapel or an edicule, as it's called, so that people could visit it and venerate it. In the previous episode, I mentioned that the church has been destroyed twice since then. It also suffered from earthquakes and a big fire in 1808. So what we see today is not what was built by Constantine and Helena, obviously. It is much of what was built later by the Crusaders. And the edicule that we see today dates from after the fire that happened in 1808. You can visit the edicule from the inside, but sometimes you have to wait in a very long line. And the priests that are guarding the site generally do not allow you to stay inside for a very long time. So they kind of want the line to keep moving and they quickly tell you to get out from there. But when you go inside, you enter through a low door. You have to bend to get in. And then you first arrive into a very small chapel called the Angel's Chapel. And in the middle of that chapel, what do you see? A piece of stone that is believed to be part of that big circular stone that used to close off the tomb where Jesus was buried. They used to do that. They had these big rolling stones that they would roll in front of the tomb so that, for example, wild animals wouldn't be able to come in and eat the body. And in the Bible, we do read about the big stone that has been removed that Mary sees when she comes to the tomb three days after his crucifixion. And the angel tells her that Jesus has risen. So they believe that this stone is part of that rolling stone. Then you have to bend down again and you come into the second chamber, which is even smaller. It can have maybe maximum three people, I would say. And that is where the actual tomb area is. Now, there are long studies that have been done about the type of tomb and the way that Jesus was buried, or maybe that he was just left on a stone inside the tomb after they had anointed him because it was a Shabbat. It was a Friday when he was crucified. And in the end of the Friday, when the Shabbat starts, it is forbidden for Jews because don't forget Jesus was a Jew. It was forbidden to move the dead body into the actual burial niche. So some people believe that he was never really put into the tomb, into the what is called the Kochim tomb, which was a niche in which he would have been pushed, but that he may have still laid on the stone inside the cave. Now, to protect the actual stone on which Jesus would have been laid, there is a marble slab on the original stone. So what you see there, the marble slab is not the original stone. The original stone, the real rock, is below the marble slab. And this is the part of the tomb where on the Holy Saturday, the holy fire emerges. When the patriarch comes in and he prays and he lights the candle from the fire that is given by God, and then it is spread around the church and from there around the world, basically. Under the status quo, the three main religious communities in Palestine, the Eastern Orthodox, the Roman Catholics and the Armenian Apostolic Churches, they all have rights to the interior of the tomb. So all three communities, the Orthodox, Catholics and Armenians, celebrate their masses here daily on set times. If you visit the Edicule and you come out from it and then you turn right, you go to its backside. And on the back of the Edicule, you will find a small addition to the Edicule. It's like a small extra chapel, which is made for the Coptic Orthodox. And usually you can see one of the monks inside and you are allowed to go in if you want. And from here, you can also see the backside of the natural rock with the marble slab on it, where Jesus was laid when he was buried in the tomb. And just across from this Coptic Orthodox Church chapel, there's also another door that gives you access to a chapel inside the apse of the church. And it looks a little bit shabby, actually. It's not in a very good state. 
Also, this is the outcome of the status quo because there are some different points of view of who is responsible for this chapel, but it is used by the Syriac Orthodox Church on Sundays for their masses and on their feast days. The chapel is dedicated to Joseph of Arimathea. That was the man who gave his tomb to bury Jesus. So it's called the Chapel of Joseph of Arimathea, but the Armenians also lay claim on it. And now the interesting thing here is that from this chapel, you can see the bedrock of the original stone quarry. And if you go a little bit deeper, you bend down, you can see several original Kochim tombs for burial that date back to 2000 years ago, from the first century. And there's a tradition that says that these are the tombs of Joseph of Arimathea himself, the one who gave his tomb to Jesus, and of Nicodemus. He was a Jewish Pharisee and a member of the Jewish Sanhedrin, the court, who was one of the first Jewish followers of Jesus. And Jesus met with him regularly in private to answer a lot of his questions. After seeing these old Kochim tombs, you go back through the Syriac chapel into the rotunda. You have the edicule in the middle. And now we continue our circle around the edicule in the rotunda. And we are back at the entrance of the edicule. And directly across from the entrance of the edicule, you can see what is called the Catholicon. And this is the central part of the nave that was built by the Crusaders. This is where the nave and the transept meet. So I hope that you know how churches were often built in the shape of a cross. The long part is called the nave and the short part is called the transept. The Christians took this style of building, the basilica style, from the Romans, a long Whole. And they added the transept to create the shape of the cross, the cross on which Jesus was crucified. So here in the Holy Sepulchre Church, in the center of the church where the nave and the transept meet, this is where we have an altar. And this part is Greek Orthodox. Here you can find a stone that is called the omphalos, which means the navel of the world, the center of the world. Just like the ancient Greeks believed that Delphi was the center of the world, the Orthodox Christians believe that this place where the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus happened is the center of the world. Inside this Catholicon, you find two seats, one for the Patriarch of Jerusalem and one for the Patriarch of Antioch, and they are situated opposite of each other. Now, after you looked around in the Catholicon and saw all its details, you will go back, you face again the Edicule, and now we go to the right, and this is the northern side of the church. This is an area that belongs to the Catholics, and here we find an altar that is dedicated to St. Mary Magdalena. Mary Magdalena is mentioned several times in the Bible. She was one of the female followers of Jesus who left her family and followed Jesus and took care of him. There are many stories about her. Some of them say that she was possessed by demons. Some of them say that she was a prostitute and that she found healing and forgiveness with Jesus. She was also one of the women who followed him on the day of his crucifixion and witnessed the crucifixion. And then she was the first one to go to his grave, to his tomb, and find that it was empty. And she told the other disciples, the other followers of Jesus, that he had been resurrected. From this Catholic part of the church, you can usually enter into the northern part of the nave, although at the moment that I'm recording this, it is being renovated and you do not have a direct access. So you'd have to walk around, back around the Catholicon to reach what is called the prison of Christ. 
But once these renovations are over, you can continue on this side and you will see a number of columns and pillars that are dating back to the first church. These are a few of the remains of the very first church that was built by Constantine. And then there are other columns that date back to the times of renovations, mainly the Crusader time. In between those columns, you see the arches, and these are referred to as the Arches of the Virgin, and that is a reference to Mother Mary, the mother of Jesus, the Virgin who gave birth to Jesus, because it is thought that she made visits to the tomb of Jesus and that she passed by here on her way to the tomb. Now, at the far end of this nave, on the left, we can see a small Greek chapel, and this is called the Prison of Christ. So it's believed that Jesus was kept here on this spot before he was eventually crucified, although this is a story not mentioned in the Bible, and it kind of contradicts the generally accepted stages of the cross, because Jesus was brought in from the old city through the gate and then crucified on the cliff. And this is quite a way from that route. Now, if we continue further around the semicircular aisle, then we see another two chapels on the left. The first one is the Greek chapel of St. Longinus. And St. Longinus is the Roman soldier who pierced Jesus in his side to see if he was really dead. And then after that, he believed. He believed that Jesus was the Son of God and he accepted him as the Messiah. Further along, we have the Armenian chapel of the division of the garment or the division of the robes. And this recalls that the Roman soldiers, after Jesus was stripped of his clothes, divided his clothes among them. And because the tunic that Jesus was wearing was without a seam, they couldn't rip it. They couldn't rip it. It was woven from top to bottom, so it was impossible to divide it. So what they did, they decided to cast lots to decide who would take the cloth. And according to Christians, this was a prophecy from the Old Testament that was fulfilled because in the book of Psalms, it is written, they parted my garments among them and for my clothing, they cast lots. That's written in Psalm 22. So they say this is a fulfillment of something that was already written in the Old Testament of the Bible. And now you see a stairway that goes down on your left side. We will go down there, but before we do that, just take a few steps further and you can see a third chapel. This is the Orthodox Chapel of the Derision, as it's called. And this means the mocking of Jesus. This happened when he was condemned in the beginning by Pilate and the soldiers then dressed him in red rope and they put him a crown of twigs with thorns on his head to mock him and to make fun of him saying that oh you are the king of the Jews look at you and in this chapel you will see a stone pillar and it is said that this pillar comes from the building the praetorium where Jesus was condemned and where they mocked him and now we're going to go down the 29 stairs that take us deeper into the original stone quarry. And as you walk down the stairs, look closely to the walls. You will see hundreds of crosses that were carved into the stone by pilgrims who visited over many centuries of time. Recently, they did research and they suggest now that all these different crosses were not all made by the different individual pilgrims who came and crossed into the wall. Most probably, especially during the Crusader time, pilgrims paid somebody, some artists who would do this like a service because most of the crosses are very, very similar. So it looks like it was the work of maybe one person or, or at least just a few people. But it shows you how many pilgrims have visited the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Now, the chapel that we reached now as we went down the stairs used to belong to the Ethiopians. 
But because they had financial problems, they were forced to sell it. And it was bought by the Armenians. So now it is an Armenian chapel. It is officially called the Chapel of St. Helena because she, the mother of Constantine, was the one who ordered to build the church. And according to the tradition, she was the one who searched for evidence of Jesus' crucifixion. And she found the crosses and the tools that were used by the Romans to crucify Jesus. But the Armenians call this chapel the chapel of St. Gregory the Illuminator. And St. Gregory the Illuminator was the saint who brought Christianity to Armenia. And I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but the Armenians were the first nation to adopt Christianity as a nation. The king at that time decided that Christianity would become the state's religion. And that happened in the year 300 after Christ. If you look at the mosaic floor in this chapel, you will see that it looks like a Byzantine mosaic floor, but it's actually not ancient. I've heard some tour guides saying that this is an ancient Byzantine floor, but this is not correct. It is made in the last century by an Israeli artist called Hafa Yofi, and it depicts the churches in historical Armenia. From this chapel, the Chapel of St. Helena, There is another staircase with another 13 steps that brings you even more down into the cave where they discovered the Holy Cross, the nails and the crosses of the two robbers. This is the deepest part of the stone quarry. Now, according to a legend, St. Helena, who wanted to know which cross was Jesus' cross, brought in a very sick woman and she had her touch the three different crosses. And then when she touched the true cross of Christ, she was healed. And that's how St. Helena knew which one of the three crosses was Jesus' cross. The true cross was taken by the Persians in 614 and then later brought back by the Byzantine emperor And since then, it has been chopped up into many different pieces and sent around the world. So there is not the cross now that you can visit and that you can see, but it is as relics been spread all over the world to different churches. This cave that we're in is actually bigger than what you can see today because the wall on the left side has been placed in the middle of a bigger space. And on the other side is the continuation of the cave. And that side is accessible from the Armenian chapel of St. Helena up the stairs. But you can only get in there if you ask the Armenian priests. But if you get the chance, then you will find inside that part of the cave a very special stone with what is probably the oldest Christian inscription that was found in Jerusalem. It wasn't found here, it was found somewhere else, but it was brought here to safeguard it. And it reads in Latin, Domine Ivimus. And then there is a drawing of a boat. The translation of Domine Ivimus is, Lord, we have gone, or Lord, we went. And this refers to their pilgrimage to the Holy Land. We went from the country of origin to Jerusalem, to the place where Jesus was crucified. And this dates back to probably around 330 AD. And that is the end of our virtual tour through the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. If you are in the church, you can now walk back up and find your way to the exit. I really hope you enjoyed this episode. And Once I am a licensed tour guide, I'm happy to take you into the church and show you all of these myself. Thank you for listening. Please consider supporting the podcast with a donation. It is free to listen, but there are costs involved in the production and quite a lot of time. It's very much appreciated if listeners chip in and you can already do that with a couple of bucks on the Kofi page. 
You can find the link in the show notes as well as other links to the social media accounts and the website. I hope you will tune in again for the next episode every other week, a new one. If you enjoy listening to Stories from Palestine podcast, then I think you will also enjoy listening to my favorite podcast, which is called Jerusalem Unplugged. You can find it on most podcast players and on social media at Jerusalem Unplugged.